Uh, can you guys hear me all right back there? Uh, everyone who's kind of crammed up, there's rooms or seats or hang out at the top. Totally cool. Uh, what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit about the way I think about data science and the world of how things are changing, uh, especially from the landscape over the last few years, but also not only at the national level, but the international level. Obviously, I speak for myself. Uh, I do not speak for any federal government or any of those organizations, because I was let go. Uh, <laughs> I wonder why. Uh, so like, let's start with the time we live in. We live in this really, really remarkable time. And I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about government. I'm just talking about the way we think about our products. And a decade ago, te a decade ago, not even two decades ago, when it was two decades ago, there were just like, a, like three or four people in a classroom this size would actually have laptops. There was no internet connectivity in this hall. Actually, this hall used to be a library. But totally different point is that what happened 10 years ago was you know, the iPhone was just coming out. We didn't have the notion of pictures really on a phone, a little bit on the flip phone. Videos were not even conceivable. These were ideas that were just not in the picture. You know, The idea of buying shoes online, totally weird. Uh, no one would do that. Uh, it was just at the point where people were like getting comfortable with this idea of buying books online. Uh, carrying stacks of maps to a new city, totally normal. That was an okay thing. And so what is it today? What does today look like? This isn't just what today looks like. This is what we expect. This is expected behavior from our technology. You know, today we expect that news is instant. It's buzzing on our device. It's on our wearable. We get the updates in real time. It's customized. Traffic, we have the ability to access it. We have the ability to reroute around traffic. You have car service on demand. Why have a car? You know, one day shipping is now becoming a reality. You can also have your food delivered before it gets cold, mostly. Still is working on that. And then you got this idea that we have this new way of thinking about our fitness and our health through trackers and other type of, type, type of technologies. So this has been a radical revolution in our lifetime, a complete revolution. And the foundation of this revolution, fundamentally, is why you're all here. It's data. Data is this revolution that's taking place. And we're about to see another revolution happen in the very, very near time, in the next couple of years, in fact. And those things are Internet of Things, genomic and precision medicine, this whole blending of data science, machine learning, AI, autonomous vehicles, drones, self-driving cars, you name it. All of that's about to radically shift. In fact, we're starting to see that shift right now in combat zones where now people are starting to use drones in very different ways, which leads to a very interesting question of how do we think about the investment in the next generation of fighters? What does that look like when we have drones? What does this look like with respect to self-defense? What does this look like with regards to our posture on drones and other questions? All these things are open, and we have to start addressing them much more rapidly. So that brings this to why have this role of a chief data scientist? What is the chief data scientist of this nation supposed to do? In fact, the role is still there, by the way. They just haven't filled it along with the chief scientist or anybody else really of note. Uh, they seem to lose more people than they actually be able to put people in roles. But that's a different lecture. <laughs> but the, the whole thing here of the chief data scientist gets to these radical questions, these very different questions. And let me pose a very interesting one that's about to happen. Every 10 years in the United States, we do a census. Why do we do a census? We do a census for two particular reasons. It's not just so data scientists have something to play with. That's helpful, but it's not the reason. The fundamental reason is we change our fabric of structure of democracy every 10 years. The distribution of the House of Representatives and votes in Congress change with the population. So we reallocate representation in this country based on that every 10 years. As a result, Federal dollars, the trillions of dollars that the federal government spends, $1 billion a day just in health care, are distributed based on that allocation of where people are. So 
in 10 years, when every device is an article of clothing, something maybe embedded in your body, a sensor, something else, and we can calculate the census every day, how do we start thinking about these questions? Do we reallocate Congress every day? Well, this is all written into the Constitution. So how does technology play this impact? What does this look like with respect to representation and the way that some of the questions that have come up around fake news, foreign government influence, and happy to get into the nuts and bolts of this since I was one of the team members involved in some of these things early on. So how do we start addressing these things and start thinking about it? And so that mission of the US Chief Data Scientist has stood up, and this is going to be the mission going forward for the office until it is changed by the president or a president, is to responsibly unleash the power of data to benefit all Americans. And there are two words that are extremely carefully chosen in the definition of this role forever going on forward for this country's history. And those two words are responsibly and all. The reason the word responsibly is done in there is just because we can doesn't mean we always should. And you've seen some of these questions. People are trying to build like AI systems to try to detect if people are gay. There's these questions around whether you should use data for gerrymandering. There's also more interesting questions about using data and ways for gene selection and what are the implications with eugenics and other type of discriminatory or other types of issues that may have benefits for healthcare. The second is all Americans. And what does it mean to have a technology that works for all Americans? And the reason it says Americans here is very specifically because this is the role of the US chief data scientist. And so the responsibility is over the US. But I think we can ask that question more broadly of what does it look like for the entire world? And when we think about that, the way I would assert for you to think about this is with this framing is that we should really think of a technology as neither radical nor revolutionary unless it benefits every single person. And think about this right now. You have amazing technology right in front of you or in your pocket. You've got a computer. You've got a phone. You've got access to amazing things. There are people that are just within five miles that have never, ever had access to log into a system, have a computer, or access any of these technologies. There are people in this world where the notion of technology is not a concept. They're fighting for food, water, clothing, shelter. The kids in Syria right now who are just battling for an opportunity for tomorrow. So what does it really mean to design a technology for everyone? And I think we have to ask that question right here in America. Right here in this country, what does it look like to have a radical revolutionary technology? So let me walk you through a quick example. So this year alone, just in this year, this is some question about what does the difference between jail and prison look like? So for those that don't know, jail is our local county layer. If you're picked up or arrested, you typically go to jail. If you are sentenced, you typically will then move on to prison. So jail is kind of your... your intermediary layer in the criminal justice system. And so 11.4 million Americans are going to cycle through our 3,100 jails. Look at that ratio of that numbers. 11.4 million people are going through 3,100 jails. They're just going in and out. How often are they going in and out? They're going to stay there on average 23 days. 23 days is the average stay. 95% will never go on to prison. Never, ever go on to prison. They plead out, they plead their case, their, or their time served, they get back on the street. So who pays for that? Where is that cost going? Right here in the county of San Diego, that is taking dollars away from fixing a road. That is taking dollars away from putting another teacher out on this, uh, in a school. That's preventing officers, fire departments from having the right equipment. It is preventing somebody in a food bank having a meal tomorrow. So when we complain about why is this broken on the street or this is not working, you can blame this problem. It's literally sucking dollars out of our infrastructure into a system where we're just cycling people just through this at an insane way. This is billions of dollars for each county that cannot be used for anything else. There are two big crises happening in this country, one of which is our health care costs. 
the other of which is our jail costs. So let's talk about Cook County Jail, which is the United States' largest single-site jail facility. The largest jail overall is LA County. The single largest jail is Cook County, 90 acres, almost 93 acres now. Cell phones don't work for miles anywhere near here. Miles. This is, by the way, just a short Uber Lyft drive away from downtown Chicago. Short drive around. But every child who sits or lives near this, this jail is living in a connectivity desert. Because no one wants to invest in next to a jail. No one wants to do that. One third of the inmates who are in this jail, we're not talking prison, jail, 90 acres of jail, one third of them have a mental health issue. Yet there's no services for mental health in there. So where's the technology revolution for these people? Where's the technology revolution for them? That's just in our society. You know, this is Pete and Kevin Early. Uh, Pete's a father. He's actually a very famous author. His son, Kevin, has uh, a mental disease, schizophrenia. And so like many people with schizophrenia, he has a psychotic episode and ends up in a situation where police are called. Uh, and that happened one night. He broke in naked to his neighbor's uh, house and was curled up in the bathtub. And we know, you don't have to listen to me, you've seen all the reports, how these incidents end up with an officer. They lead to officer involved shootings. They lead to assault on officers where officers are seriously hurt. They lead to uh, trauma. They lead to innocent bystanders getting hurt. It's a problem we're all around. Pete points out that uh, his son Kevin is alive because what happened is the officer who showed up was literally trained in what they call crisis intervention and recognized the signs of mental illness and said, look, I'm not going to do the normal thing that you see and kind of come in with a strong use of force, but I'm going to try to de-escalate the situation, get him calmed down, and not just take him to jail, get him to the right facility where you can stabilize him and get him the treatment that he needs. That happened. Kevin is stable, has a good job, and everything's working. So what prevents this from scaling? What prevents this from working all around the country? So it turns out Miami-Dade, Florida did this. They implemented this. And when they implemented it, it cost about a million and a half dollars to do. And the results are they saved $10 million in the first year. More importantly, they closed a full jail. They did it again the next year and again, and they were able to close another jail. So what's stopping us from doing that all across the country? Because literally here, we're not talking any of the sophisticated data science that you all are talking about or thinking about doing. We're talking about taking a spreadsheet of data from one part of the healthcare system and moving that data to the criminal justice system and being able to say, hey, have you seen this person? Because they typically are always cycling through our healthcare system. If you see them and they're in your criminal justice system, Hey, take them, to, take them to the right facility. Don't put them in jail. There's no machine learning or anything else in this. This is like spreadsheet 101. And it saves ridiculous dollars, tens of millions of dollars, and more importantly, saves lives. How many teachers can you buy for $10 million? How many parks could you put in place for $10 million? That's the trade-off that we're talking about. That's the amazing thing. Here's another example. Uh, the young girl there is Grace Clark. She's about 14 in this picture. That's a superintendent of police uh, of New Orleans. And this is one of my favorite pictures from White House Times. Uh, guys, who's in power in this position, in this picture? How often do you see a young black girl in the power command position with a police officer? Do you know why? She is teaching him how to write his first line of code. <laughs> that is him fat fingering like no tomorrow. And the best part of this is after he entered the data, he's like, that can't be right. It's like just a line of SQL. It's like, that can't be right. That's, that's, not, that's not how my officers act. He's like, it's your data. And that started a different dialogue. 
And so one of the things that we did is we, we decided to ask the question, what would happen if we got some of the most active members of the Black Lives Matter movement, different groups that are very concerned about officer-involved uh, incidents, police chiefs, data scientists, technologists, and put them in the White House and lock the door and said, we're not letting you out until you come up with something because we got, we got guards and they're armed. <laughs> now, we, it turns out there's a secret thing that you do in the White House is you leave White House presidential cupcakes in there, and somehow that always makes things seem to work out. And here's the interesting thing. Without any prodding, the simple thing that they all said that they would make life better for everyone all around was just sharing data. San Diego PD has no idea how they're compared and doing to San Francisco. They have no idea how they're doing next to Phoenix or Tucson or New Orleans or New York. There's no way to tell. There's a great graph that I saw that, that got shown in this meeting where this guy showed this, this graph of stop rates, black versus white. And the graphs over time are roughly 50-50. There's a slight trend difference towards uh, the, in the last few years where the, the, there's, uh, uh, blacks are being stopped a little bit more. But it, you could call it the error bar. But what's more interesting is then you look at the search rates after that. And the search rates are blacks and whites in this county, not even close. So then the next question is, why? What's going on here? And so you ask, which officers contributed the most to this? And right away, you see which officers are primarily responsible. And then you get to ask the question, well, is it because of the neighborhoods they patrol or something else? And you can just eliminate answer after answer. And so you start getting into more interesting questions, so much so that we decided to put a team from the University of Chicago of data scientists like you, and we put them in a, county, in a, in a town called Charlotte Mecklenburg, and we said, go figure out what are the reasons why we see excessive use of force by officers. And so they did feature selection. They found out a bunch of the features and across all the officers. And most officers in the department are good. There's a small number of bad apples. And so that first set of bad apples and those features show up very concretely. They are the ones where you see they have a lot of reported incidents of, it, of assaults, lots of complaints, lots of all the usual stuff. Then you go about halfway down into the, the, the list. And what do you find? There's two ones that stand out. One of which is that there's, there's a bunch of officers who have responded to suicide calls, more multiple suicide calls. Or they've responded to an incident of domestic violence where a child is present. And so these data scientists have been literally bolted on with the police, depart, police officers. And so they've been doing ride-alongs. And they figure out right away what's going on. Because what happens is you go to a suicide, you go to one of these domestic violence incidents, this is a super emotional event. It's very physically messy. All stuff's, you know, literally hell's breaking loose in these things. And then dispatch says, go back out on the street. Go do your job. Go pull somebody over. And you pull somebody over, they're flipping with you, and you haven't been able to deal with that emotional context. So where is the technology revolution for happening in policing here? Why doesn't the dispatch system take into account these ideas and start to ask, hey, if that's the issue, shouldn't we give you time to decompress, to become human again before we send you back out? If we can do that for figuring out how to route packages, why can't we do this for our officers, for our community members? And so now they're together building a new type of dispatch system that's going to take into account all these things. And that's what we called the White House Police Data Initiative. And so those two initiatives are really focused on this idea of making technology work for us rather than against us. And those cover roughly 94 million Americans in every major city in the United States. But uh, let's take this even further and ask a totally different view of this, which is a story about Jennifer Bittner. Has Jennifer, husband Rod, Jennifer has stage four metastatic breast cancer. Uh, she's been in remission for a while, but she's, it, this is something that is going to come back. And if you look at all the curves of how life expectancy, she will not survive very long. That's just a fact of the raw data. And so she wrote into us 
around this idea of the Cancer Moonshot Initiative and what we call Precision Medicine Initiative, the idea of creating truly tailored treatments. And she said, hey, you know what? I've got this son. I'd love to see my son learn how to ride a bike. And I know the pace of technology, how fast technology is changing. We're seeing all those revolutions. And she said, here's the pace of science. Why doesn't the pace of science match the pace of technology? And what are you going to do about it so that I can see my son ride a bike? And we thought, that's a very fair point. What could we do about it? What should we do about it? How can we go faster? How can we push the country forward? And so we looked at this, uh, largely with Vice President Biden, and we said, what's holding back the solution? And the most painful discovery was, most of the time, it's a database. There's data locked in a database. It's accessed by only a few people. But it's worse. It's actually thousands of databases. There's thousands of databases where this stuff is purely fractured, and no one has the ability to combine it. And the view is often that there is very likely a cure for cancer already out there. We just can't access it or bring enough data together to find a solution. One of the most powerful things for me at the White House was looking at all these kind of programs and watching, like watching unique people come up with interesting ideas to find solutions. And let me just tell you about a few of these examples. This is Matt Might. That is his son, uh, uh, Bertrand. And it's a really interesting story. When he was born, Bertrand was born, uh, they noticed some developmental issues. And the developmental issues showed up as slow speech, neck issues, stability of neck, but also that there were, when he cried, there was no tears. And so Matt took his son. Matt's a professor of computer science at University of Utah at the time. He took his son in to the physicians, and they said, your son is N of 1. Anybody heard, heard the term N of 1? N of 1 is the worst diagnosis you could ever have. N of 1 means you are the only person that humanity has seen like you, that your disease that you have, no one else has. And it is basically the equivalent of an FU statement that says the medical system will not invest in you. But Matt, being a computer scientist, said, I don't buy that. I don't buy it at all. So what he did is he wrote a blog post. And he optimized the blog post such that anybody who was searching for similar symptoms that his son had, he would rise to the top of the search rankings. So he's doing search engine optimization. And he titled the blog post, Searching for My Son's Killer. So Matt went out there and started racing for it and found it. And soon enough, another parent pinged, and another parent pinged, and another parent pinged. And it turned out there's not a small population. It turns out it's a decent population. But the medical system said no. So Matt found a bunch of researchers and said, let's get a high, very high quality genetic sequencing done of his son's DNA. And then they did that. And they found uh, that there's a defect called N-glycol-1. And now the interesting thing about N-glycol-1 is there's a bunch of drugs that are out there that might have a benefit. But they're typically not. You're not allowed to prescribe them, or your insurance won't allow you to get coverage for them because they're, not, they're what's called off-label use. You're not supposed to use them for that. So what happened in this case is Matt just found a way to get hold of these drugs, in some ways just getting them, and then some ways talking to the pharmaceutical reps and getting quality of this. And he started testing them on himself first, and then testing them on his son. And Matt actually has a video of the first time his son has taken one of these drugs and actually produces tears. This is the stuff like we typically even make movies out of. But this is what happens when one person empowered with some data and the ability to hit a whole bunch of open data sources because all the databases for pharmaceuticals are open can go crawl and start finding things and find a solution for his own son. But that's not the only example. This is Sonia and Eric. Sonia's mom was uh, diagnosed with a rare disease uh, of the brain. And it basically is a genetic disease that destroys your brain in a very, very painful, traumatic way. It just basically robs you of life. And Sonia had to go through this decision of whether to get tested for this genetic disease. So when she got tested on it, uh, it turns out she has better than 50% probability of actually having this disease. 
So Sonia and Eric were a lawyer and a city planner at the time, and they didn't know what to do. So what they decided to do is quit. They decided to re-enroll in school. One is a data scientist, one is a wet lab person. And they retrained, got their doctorates, and now have a lab at the Broad Institute in Boston, literally in a race to save her life. Their big premise is using data in novel ways to find that cure, to break apart those databases to find that solution. And it's not just them. You know, we have these people that we brought into the government, these presidential innovation fellows who come from every walk of life to open up data. And many of the data sets that you have access to on data.gov, they're the ones that figure out how to open up that data and make it more accessible and find people who can, who can uh, look for cures. You know, this is Antwi. He's with an organization called Streetwise who's using data from these open sources to come up with very novel ways to use data at the community level to empower communities that normally don't have a voice. His specialty is in the city of Oakland, but he's doing really radical things. This is Sujana. Sujana is, uh, we had her at the White House Science Fair. She was 17, 18 at this time. Sujana is so good She's, the University of Kentucky has given her a whole lab while she's in high school because she is going after renal failure, kidney disease, and she's figuring out how to make an artificial kidney. And she is, I mean, it's just spectacular what you can do with a little bit of data and technology. We have people that are, and this is in Charlotte, where they are actually using data at the local level to figure out how to actually make a more welcoming, hey, you're brand new to Charlotte. Here's how you get the services and help you need. Here's where to find stuff. And we think, when I say that, what's the first imagery that comes to your mind? Is your first imagery about migrants? Is it immigrants? Because what it should be is about a veteran who has just left active duty and is coming home. It should be about a victim of domestic violence who is restarting their life. It should be somebody who has lost their job in another part of the country that doesn't have recovery, and they have picked up and moved their family to a new town where there's different forms of economic prosperity. That's what the data shows, and that's what they're building for. But it's interesting how our model gets hijacked by talking points and things other than data. One of the things that came up, this is, we had a, a LGBT hackathon at the White House. And one of the questions that came up with them was, well, how do you want to be counted in the census? Because right now, there's only two check boxes, male, female. And we realized, well, the worst person to try to define how an LGBT person should be characterized is if you're hetero. We should ask, let the community decide it. So on their own, they decided to say, let's create the first LGBT census to make sure that they are documented in the right way and then use that data and input to figure out how do we make sure they are in the national process of being documented. And if you don't think this is important, let me remind you that right now there are a million black men who are not accounted for in the census because they have been, had their rights denied because they are in, in, in either in the criminal justice system actively right now, or they have been in this portion of our society that has been marginalized and not been given the right due. This is Tilly. You'll notice Tilly is holding uh, my, my White House notebook there, but she has a robotic arm. She has a birth defect. She doesn't have her arms past uh, her forearms, but she has a robotic arm that gives her first vers versatility. There's another one that I don't have the video of here or won't show, is uh, uh, James who has a robotic arm that's controlled by Bluetooth sensors. Very sophisticated control algorithms. Data's coming in real time from his nerves. It's fully able to control his arm. That arm is so good, it has the ability to shake my hand softly or entirely crush my skull. We didn't test that part, but, <laughs> uh, but this, is the, this is the opportunity is to give a kid like Tilly superpowers. Give her superpowers so she can lead a normal life. Give people who are coming out of combat with a loss of a limb a new life, the life that they deserve. 
This is Rebecca and Kimberly. Uh, they are six and eight. Uh, this is me prepping them just before they met with President Obama. Uh, they did not know they were about to meet President Obama. So they're giving me their explanation of what they did. And uh, they, when they were six and eight, they saw this YouTube video about launching something in this space. And they said, hey, that seems like a great idea. I don't know what you guys are doing at six and eight, but I was not launching anything into space. <laughs> But they, they figured out how to do this. They're watching YouTube videos. It's incredible. It's, it's just amazing what people have the ability to do. This is Steve from University, uh, this is at Chicago. As Steve has partial loose of one hand. He, he can only code with a very limited use. And what he's coding up with a team is finding all the places in the city where there's a break in the sidewalk or something that prevents uh, a, a wheelchair or a mobility for easy mobility all across the city and figuring out how to prioritize fixing that. And we've seen that time and time again. This is done here at South Bend, Indiana, and they are figuring out similar things. Right there in the hat, that is their CTO. And he is an immigrant from Argentina who loves South Bend and said, you know what, I'm not just going to move here, but I'm going to become the CTO of the, of the town and make, this, make the city better for everybody. His big thing with data, how do you make sure the trash is picked up on time? Right, small things that go a long way. One of the other ones we saw, this is a second year in a row that the United States has come back with the gold medal in the Olympiads, the gold, uh, math Olympiads, and that's a team visiting us at the White House. One of the cool things that they have is they don't live near each other. They're all using technology in very disparate ways to connect and trade notes and share things. There's one important thing that you'll notice in this picture that we got to work on. What is it? Inclusion and diversity, that's absolutely right. Gender as well as ethnic. Uh, met earlier with some of the team working on veteran suicide. This is what a hackathon we had. That is Sean Taylor, by the way, the person we're going to connect you with, uh, uh, who has been working on using Facebook platform to help on veteran suicide uh, and a critical problem. And which brings us to our armed forces. You know, our armed forces are putting it out there every day, every day. Uh, and for those that have served in any form of, of public service or the military, thank you for doing it. It is a job we do not say thankful, thank you enough for, for what you do. Uh, and part of that was, how do we protect that jet? How do we protect them? And one of the things that we figured out is we looked at this thing and we said, hey, you know what? Security, cybersecurity, we're having all these breaches, these problems. How secure is the Pentagon? So with Secretary uh, Ash Carter, we said, well, let's, how about we go get some people and try to hack the Pentagon? And he gave us his look of like, you are telling me what? <laughs> you want to hack the Pentagon? We said, yeah, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll do it in a responsible way. We'll get white hat hackers. We'll figure out they'll be all good, and we'll try to get them together. And so we invited everyone, all these, these hackers, to say, come hack the Pentagon, and we'll pay you if you, if you, if you find a vulnerability. So that's, that's David. Uh, David at the time was studying for his AP exam and then saw the call to hack the Pentagon. And so took a little break from studying for his AP exam and found six vulnerabilities uh, in the <laughs> Pentagon. Uh, now there's one thing about the White House that is really true. It will give you an inferiority complex because like, you meet people like this and you're like, whoa. <laughs> I got a one on my AP computer science exam, by the way. <laughs> there was nothing about finding vulnerabilities. I, I think they could have given me a zero. I think the one was like gratuity points or something. Uh, but how long did it take for the first vulnerability to be reported? 13 minutes. 13 minutes. And the best argument that we heard of why we shouldn't do this, if you do this, the Chinese government and the Russian government are going to know all the vulnerabilities. Our answer, duh, they probably already know. <laughs> Shouldn't we know? So now this idea of hack the Pentagon is available to every, all the agencies, and all of them are doing these kind of efforts to figure out how do we make these systems more responsible, scalable, and, and safer over time. It brings me to my final one here. I think final one. is uh, This is, uh, we started a service called Crisis Text Line about five years ago. Anybody heard of Crisis Text Line? Oh, no one. Crisis Text Line is a service where some people know it. Yeah. Uh, so, so, Crisis Text Line is a suicide service that if you 
People don't call suicide hotlines anymore. People text. So it's a texting uh, suicide hotline. And the power of it is because you're texting, we can do natural language processing. And for example, we've been able to look at the system, and we know if you use in your first few text messages the word Tylenol, aspirin, or anything of that nature, you are somewhere between four times to 16 times more likely to be actively committing suicide at that moment in time. Which means the counselors can reprioritize the queue and try to figure out where you are so we can get an ambulance to you right away. On average night, they save about seven to eight lives every night from actively, people who are active in the act of committing suicide. You can use technology in super subtle ways where you don't see it, where it acts as a force multiplier for giving you efficiency and scale, but fundamentally saving lives. And then this leads me to the, the other side of things, which is what does it really mean to be a citizen? We had a person on our team named Jake Brewer, uh, and Jake was killed uh, while we were in the White House. He was actually raising money for cancer, was killed in a bike accident, uh, and that's his, his uh, daughter. But uh, Jake sent me two emails just uh, before he died. His, uh, his last email to me was uh, simply titled, Ultimate Frisbee, South Lawn, how to, and then in the subject line was, how do we make this happen? Uh, we did not play there, but we may have played at another undisclosed location where you often see the president's helicopter landing, but I can't say the name of. But his first email was about this. He said, what would it look like if all of us, all of us are people who have technology in our hands, who have readily accessible, who get some of the top education that not just the country off offers, but the world offers, the people who are going to be the future leaders of this nation, what would it look like if we took a pledge or made a commitment? What would it look like? And this is the one that he proposed. And I think there's a few things that I think I would encourage you to think about about this. I won't read all of it. But there's a couple things that are really, I found interesting in the second part of it, which is, you know, I pledge to serve and to push my country, when right, to be kept right, when wrong, to be set right. Wherever my ancestors and I were born, I claim America and I pledge to live like a citizen. One of the most interesting things that all of you are about to be confronted with and through your projects you are dealing with and you are going to be challenged with in every day of your life going forward because you have this extraordinary powers, these superpowers of technology, is what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be a citizen, not just of this nation, but of this planet, of this country, the systems of countries, all of us together, of humanity, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to use these technologies in unique ways? So here's the three lessons I have for you, the key, three core principles I have for you for about data science. Remember, the people are always greater than the data. You're going to work with all this data. There are going to be numbers. There are going to be you know, graphs or everything. Those data points have names. You're going to say, oh, that's an edge case. That edge case has a name. Sally, Juan, Jesse, Mark, Marco, Julie. They all have names. When somebody says that's an edge case, don't accept that. Push for the name. What can you do with that data to fight to make it life and better for one better, more person? What could that enable? Two. Data's force multiplier. Everything that you have, I can't even begin to express how much power you all have. The amount of technology that you have and the ability that you can do something is remarkable. And that doesn't mean just starting a company, right? Because you could do that with data. And that is extremely important and a possible thing. But so are so many other things. So how can we do that? And then the last part is the time of engagement in society to do these things is now. We are seeing fundamental lift and changes from people who are driving technology in unique ways. So let me just end with, how do we make this happen? Uh, and how do you actually turn this into this? And I'll just share with you the card I kept in my notebook at the White House. So this is a card I kept with me every day. And the first part starts with, dream in years, plan in months, evaluate in weeks, and ship daily. Always be aiming to deliver something every day. Every day, 
The thing we do at our nighttime table at, at home and with my family is our kids always come home and we have to, everyone has to t- say, what are they thankful for and what did they learn today? Learn something new every day. Try to produce or create and make something every day. Second part, how do you actually make these technologies work? Prototype for 1x. Prototype, try it. See if you can get something to work. Just see if it might be viable. Two, build it for 10x. See if you can build it for 10x to scale. See if it might work a little bit more. And then finally, engineer it for 100x. Make it work for the broad, big systems. Doesn't matter if this is the White House. This is the same lessons that we use for LinkedIn. Same lessons we use for Relate IQ. Same lessons we used in every other major company we've invested in. The final part here is what's required to cut the timeline in half and what's required to double the impact. For those that recognize what's behind that is, as soon as you ask those questions, you're putting yourself on a logarithmic trajectory rather than a linear one. And when you prioritize your products, and for those that are going to go on to business and the product manager or data scientist, is one of the single most important things you can do is always getting prioritization happen in that way because what rises to the top are things that put you on an exponential curve rather than a linear curve. That's what separates a difference in a company from being meh to being awesome. It's what separates from good policy from great policy. True in all those aspects. And then finally, let me just return back to the people aspect. So I didn't actually show you any graphs or any equations or any sophisticated machinery behind these things. That's because one of the most important things we can do when we talk about data is focus on the stories of the people. The stories of the people, the story of what can be done with data is what actually drives a conversation forward. And if there's one thing that you can do singularly and learn here now that's going to carry forward is learn how to communicate with data. That is what singularly separates data scientists who have moved forward. And Dr. Wojtek is a perfect example of this. Professor Wojtek <laughs> is a perfect example of this. Is unless you can communicate the power and ability of data, you cannot change an organization's culture, a company's trajectory, or the policies that help make something happen. So I'll stop there, and we can talk about anything from this to cybersecurity to Russia to (laughs) why do they keep stopping people who skateboard on the campus? (laughs) So let's start there. All right. question for you. Sure. So you're talking about the power of databases mm-hmm. to solve some of our yeah. problems. What do we do when the databases from which we're drawing our data are themselves reflecting inherent biases, right? So algorithmic biases. So if you're looking at recidivism rates, this is a classic story, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, in the United States, these recidivism rates in the data analysis would train on skin color yeah. to suggest that people in the United States, the best predictor or one of the best predictors of going back to prison would be their skin color. And that removes any culpability then, right? So there's a sort of trend of, look, I'm just speaking to the data. The data just says this. It's not, there's no one responsible anymore. Who do you hold culpable when the data just speaks to something like that? How do you, how do you balance these issues of data-driven culture to improve, from a technological standpoint, mm-hmm. so many aspects of life and ethics? Yeah. Well, you, you raise a, a whole bunch of critical issues there. The first is, as data people, we cannot take the database as truth, mm-hmm. right? Like oftentimes we say the database is like, oh, good, I got the data. Woo, okay, let's go to work. Most often we have to now move to a world where we say, is this, is this what portion of the sample space do, have I captured with this data? What are the implications of how this data was captured. Uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Clinical trials in the United States. Clinical trials don't have black people in them. They also don't have Asian people in them. They also don't have Hispanic people in it. You know who else it doesn't have in it? Women. You know who it has in it? Middle-aged white males. 
who can afford living near large-scale academic research centers. So when you think about these new great therapies, they're not designed based on a population that, respect, that reflects our society. So what do we need to, to do to start addressing it? And why isn't that the, the case? And you can back out a whole slew of reasons, some of them cultural, some of them biased, some of them other things. But we have to start getting to that question of, of that. One of the most powerful ways that I was taught how to do this, and, and this came directly from President Obama, was do you have somebody at the table who's in the database? Mm -hmm. Not somebody who represents people in the data. Do you have somebody whose data is in the database? And it was a really powerful thing, because you're like, well, that's not really scalable. But as soon as you put people around the table who are in the database, oh my gosh, you get different answers. <laughs> you get other questions about the data and other things that make you see the data in a very, very different light. And, and every time we did that, you know, there's almost a version that's been coming up and going around the community of, what is the golden rule of data? You know, like treat this data like it was your own or treat it better than it was your own. Like what if it was like your parents' data was in this data set? What would you do? And then the other part is there is I think for, we're very often, we're just like run, you know, our favorite toolkit against this without asking the question of, what biases might be in there? And is there a way that you could intentionally insert bias or force it to say, like, what happens if, if I gave it the data set now, something that would be biased, what would it happen? And the way you find that, like, for example, if we had that, I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, there's a, uh, and some of you may have seen these. I think you create a collection of these. Is, is there's a, there's, when you go into immigration, there's a scanner that kind of moves up and down. It takes a picture of you. And, then, and it says, like, don't smile too much. Keep your eyes open. And some brilliant person hadn't put uh, a broad diversity of ethnic profiles in there. So for Asian people, it says, open your eyes. And you're like, my eyes are open. <laughs> uh, and you're like, how am I supposed to convince you, like, my eyes are open? <laughs> and and th like, th I'm not making this like, uh, like, there's tons of examples of this, right? And so who would have caught that? You know, we, don't, we can't just say, oh, we have to have every single kind of person on a team. But if you have enough diversity and inclusion on a team, somebody will say, hey, what's a data portion of a data set that we might want to run through this to see if there's, there's a problem? Right. And, and, and that type of thing, I'll give you another perfect example. The one I asked the, the Google car team was like, so will this car recognize a wheelchair? Uh, <laughs> Because that seems like a good idea to make sure that that's in the database. But probably pretty low probability you're going to have that in your data set if you're driving around Palo Alto. Uh, you know, those simple kind of questions, the, the, those, those type of things we have to question. So do you see something like, so what that sounds like, inter, inter, inserting bias into your databases intentionally. Sounds a little bit like the chaos, chaos monkey yeah. approach, right? It is a uh, chaos monkey. It's a perturbation theory. It's a pretty, exactly, yeah. So for people not familiar, was it Netflix that started mm -hmm. this? Uh, the Netflix team wanted to test the robust, robustness of their infrastructure. Their, and so what they would do was there was initially just a person on the team whose job it was was to, to write code that would maliciously and randomly go through and remove bits of code from uh, Netflix's infrastructure. And if the system was redundant uh, prop properly, then it would, be, uh, it would be robust against these kinds of intrusions. And that's you know, the, combining that sort of with the idea of, of mm -hmm. the Pentagon hack day, do you see a role for perturbation theory type stuff of, of inserting malicious data into your databases as well as white hat data science? Yeah. I guess? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the Russian government did it. In what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that is, yeah. that, 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 that is a version of it, is that, you know, people often say, nah, that would, you know, that's not... You know, not going to happen. But you know, the, the version, other version of it that you don't hear about is Google actually did a really good job of this on ads. And the reason they had it is they had this guy Matt Cutts, who actually now runs the U.S. Digital Service. And Matt's job was to think about how can people game Google AdWords and search optimization and figure out like how is this going to get abused and how am I going to make sure like this is clean and acceptable. So, so he, he kind of had that, that role of let me mess with the system. And I think we have to figure out, like, we're, we're still in that phase of, please, can I have a little bit of data? Uh, and, and we're going to need to switch to, okay, we've got lots of data. 
how is this how is this acceptable? Right. So you you mentioned uh, here the uh, what would you call it the ethos at the end here from yeah. Jake Brewer. Uh, I'd seen something a couple weeks ago. You you'd mentioned a, uh, a sort of a Hippocratic oath for data science. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So we we and this is I think going to be something that you are all going to be confronted with is this question of what is what is the ethical practices of data science and that portion of responsibility? Just because we can doesn't mean we should. And there's going to be a time where you're going to be asked to do something with data, and how are you going to hold your line? I mean, there are stories I'm sure we can both tell you of like where people are like, we want to do this, and you're like, no, we don't. And there's somebody that says, yes, we do. And you're like, how do you stop that? How do you prevent somebody from doing harm to a group of population or harm to the organization or both? And, and how, do you, how do you do that? There isn't a viable mechanism to do that yet. So we have to have some way for data scientists to say, this is not OK. Right. This is not right to do that. Now, if that's an oath, maybe. Is it maybe a guiding set of principles? Maybe. But what I think is important is, as a community, we need to start talking about how do we want to have our voice heard? You know, somebody who's in, a, in an organization, if they say, you, you should do this, like as an ad, and somebody says, that is not cool, there's a mechanism to say no. We don't have that in data. Right. And, and the impacts of that are astonishing. I, I, I mean, there are lives that are cost. There is technology that is being sold to foreign governments that are used to identify people who are trying to, uh, you know, basically protest or, uh, you know, use their, their voice, and they are being literally hunted down and killed because people can use you know, tracking technologies equally effectively. Well, so my grad student, Tom, when he gave his lecture last week, showed the Strava incident, Yeah. Right? So that's a company that right. was doing a cute, fun thing with no ill intent that accidentally gave away something pretty serious, right? Right. So you're talking about building data bases and giving people access to data but at the same time, those data, what do you do when they contain information that maybe people shouldn't have? Absolutely. So this is a big struggle. And this is not, you know, Strava example is the latest on a long, a long line. line, you know, going back to AOL days of search queries. Search queries were given out. People identified people. The reason that data was given out was so science could get done. Exactly. The consequence of the community and everyone saying, this is bad, this is bad, basically made it so that other companies would not ever give out their data. Mm -hmm. The next version to give out some data was Netflix and for the first Netflix prize. The second Netflix prize had a similar set of de-anonymization that happened, and they were sued. And so they said, well, basically, we're not going to give out any data. Similar reason why you have not seen LinkedIn give out real data or Uber or Lyft or Facebook. The reason they don't give out data is because these similar things. So how do we figure out how to maybe give a version of an alpha data set? Right. And maybe you have to log in and see some of that data. And then maybe there's more data through concentric circles of both legal uh, uh, signups that you do, plus all the way eventually to, you know, you can only access this data on uh, sandbox environments. Right. Yep. But, but we have to find a new model. Because otherwise, there's no way to open up this data. And let, let me give you a completely counterpoint, a, a counter version. The opioid data set that CMS released was not the opioid data set. It was all prescription, basically prescribing results for the United States that the government pays for under, under um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is a billion dollars a day. And so he said, let's open up that data set. ProPublica is the group that went through that data set and said, what? is going on with opioid prescriptions. This is crazy. And so they're the ones that figured it out. And so that's a case of opening up data leads to incredible life-saving measures. So uh, Michael Liu, actually a student here, who he's come talk to me a couple of times about this, about the issue of uh, policing almost, right? So the, who, who would be the ones in charge? So you're, you're advocating right now, at the lowest level, there would be institutional level self-policing, mm -hmm. right? Which I've seen, I've seen evolve, right? So working with companies that initially anyone could access data almost, right? Uh, and then you get to these levels of realization, like your level's talking about, right? If you want to work, uh, if you want to access data, say at Facebook, uh, because you need to access individual people's data uh, for quality assurance. If somebody calls in with a complaint, 
or emails and says something's wrong with my account. Some human being needs to log in and look at that account information. But in order to have that permission, you have to sign up or sign out yeah. like you as the QA team member and unlock those data for that period of time. That gives you access to that one record in the database. So is there a way earlier on, because any startup now can launch a business, collect data from people's phones, and people click the EULA and mm -hmm. all's good to go. Is there a way at the earliest levels to build in some of that uh, structure to ensure that any company begins with that kind of data security? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what is your vision of that? Yeah, so I think if we ask that question in a year, we'll have a totally different answer. But here's, I think, the trajectory that we're on. The first one that we have to recognize is this argument that is often referred to as democratization of data, which is giving everyone as much access to the data as possible. And, and the reason that is so important is that's, that's how innovation often happens in an organization. You know, in Facebook, you, there's still something that that's, it used to be called HiPal, now they have a new version of it, but you used to be able to see every query that anybody was able to run. A couple reasons. One, that gives you audibility, but two is, it gives you this incredibly power. You want to see what query Zuck is running? You get to start with that. And now you get to modify those queries. So you get to build on top of what other people have done. So transparency, but also collaboration. And so that gives you a different way. The second is this ability to start implementing differential privacy or other ideas into the database so that you may get close to the answer. You don't need the exact answer, but you get something close enough. And then the other one is not just giving access to the database, but giving tooling. So if you need very specific data because you're customer service, right. you build a tool for that. And it's got analytic sophistication, logging, all the stuff behind it that doesn't allow everyone to, to access it. And, and you know, that is where we've seen a lot of these privacy breaches happen is somebody has built a tool with good intention, and then it's become this thing where everyone had access to it and you're just like, oh gosh, like why? Like that was a debugging tool and now it has gotten, it's gotten a life of its own. Yep. And, and I've seen that in every single, it's not just like Uber or somebody else. I've seen that in Across every, every single company that has, that, that, that has happened where somebody has looked at, including our national security apparatus, is we have had cases that have been reported publicly, so I can say it, is you, know, you have had people who have actually looked up former girlfriends and boyfriends using national security technologies because we thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> but you know, like that, that, that's, a, that's a problem of, of, of making sure the technology cannot be used that way and auditability, and that, that should create alarms in right. systems. We can build that. Yeah. Audibility is important. All right, I, don't, I want to stop stealing yeah. all of your time. So open up to the questions. We have 20 more minutes. Pretty quick off the gun there. Yeah. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Wow. Woo! That is off the bat. Uh, I think it's summarized Facebook good or bad. <laughs> uh, but, but, but also, you ask a really, really, there's a number of set of things that you really are calling out that are important, which is what is a platform like Facebook or Twitter or something else responsibility to its users? Uh, to the content it has, its what is it, its shareholders, and all of those things in between. So let's, let's first talk about the level set, right, the, where we should level set. The United States democracy was attacked. Full stop, attacked. It was attacked by organizations that include the Russian government, you have the North Korean government, and others. And I'm being very careful and specific here not to say Russians or the Chinese. And I think it's very important that we call it this delineation. These are governments, these are other non state actors and others, not necessarily a broad population of the people. And, and that is something that we need to take into account because we're, we're making just carte blanche generalizations at times. Second, these platforms were notified, they were notified. And they did not take the progressive action 
that they could have or should have. So right there, I think we have a challenge to ask, what prevented them from taking this seriously? Is it because the issues of this type were conflated around that time of the questions of encryption and all the other things that were happening? Is it just because there was too much of an adversarial relationship between the government and platforms and technology? Is it because of stock issues? Is it, what, what is it? You know, I think there's an important conversation to be had there. The other one I think which is in there is we have to ask, what does it look like for content on a platform? And I think we're very entering into a space, as, as uh, Bill Gates has recently pointed out, where the technology companies are inviting in regulation. Mm -hmm. They're inviting in regulation because if you say, eh, not my problem, let's look at the fact that the world's most powerful democracy was hacked, the world's largest democracy is about to have an election, India. And in that case, in every Indian election, there have been no small number of deaths due to religious strife between Hindu and Muslims, a lot of times stoked by political nature. So when that content comes through for that election, is it the responsibility of WhatsApp or Facebook or Twitter? Tell that to the family of people who are killed. We had a situation, just, just happened last week, where a person walked in with an AR-15 into a school. Where did they consume content to learn about things? We have had, simul simultaneously, somebody, a ma young man, a father of two young kids, who drove up to a pizzeria in DC with an AR-15 to investigate why was there a child smuggling porn ring from a presidential candidate because he read that content on social media, right? This is, this is a Comet pizza. And that situation luckily did not escalate. No one was killed in that, but still a person walked into a pizza parlor with a loaded AR-15 looking for young kids who were being held against their will. Like that, like the fact that, that, that information can drive people to action is really troubling. What does this look like when people are putting out information about how to build a bomb? What does it look like when people are talking about some of these systems? And, and that, is, that is a conversation that needs to be hap had happening much faster than it was. One of the things that's been very powerful is that, and, and problematic is, that the platforms have not also come clean very fast with regards to the data sets. Like, oh, what, let's see all these ads. Let's see them. The people, by the way, for those that don't know where Congress got all the ads, there's a Slack channel called Data for Democracy. And they basically said, you know what? We're going to go figure out these ads. They put together the data set, and they handed that to Congress. And then Facebook's like, oh, wait, we better do that too. How funny is it that there's one arm of these organizations, these companies, that, and this is incredible in the literal sense, that is asking for more regulation. Uh, and some of the richest people in our country right now are asking to be taxed more. <laughs> that simultaneously, these other arms of the same companies are avoiding what they can, right? It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's a very confusing time in terms of the interface between technology, politics, mm -hmm. and governance. I, and you know, the FCC is a perfect example of this. You know, a free and fair internet for everybody, and the, the notion of of access for everyone, uh, and the current administration's stance on this is very troubling. You know, this is this is this is things that create more divide than than less divide, and and one of the reasons why you're seeing people get more concerned about this is is, is if you just take something like healthcare policy, we have enough data now to literally show that if you live in a state where the Affordable Care Act was implemented maximally, including what's called Medicare uh, benefits, the expansion of Medicare benefits, your life ex expectancy is better in the states where you did expand it and fundamentally worse in states where they did not. Like, that is, it's not a debate now. We know concretely. We also know concretely that if your state did not implement the full benefits, your rural hospitals are more likely to shut down and you're not going to actually have care. And this was an argument that was put out very early on, saying, like, this is why this money is being given, to make sure that everyone has access to hospitals. Right. But it's now obvious. But yet people still say, like, no, we want to take away these, the, the, these benefits. These benefits don't hurt 
people in the metropolitan areas. They hurt those that are in the most rural areas. Well, they want to keep the Affordable Care Act. They want to get rid of Obamacare. That, that is true. But, yes. And for those that don't know, the Affordable Care Act, interestingly enough, was written up originally by what's called the Heritage Foundation as a l- long list of proposals when uh, President Reagan came into mm-hmm. office. And it was the most conservative ideas at the time. And so that first version of the Affordable Care Act was actually implemented by Mitt Romney when he was governor, as a Republican, governor of, of uh, Massachusetts. And then the Obama administration said, and I, I actually work with Bob Kocher, who helped write the Affordable Care Act, and it was like, hey, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So it's an interesting thing that we also label things certain ways uh, to, to, to drive division rather than bring people together. All right, so we have time for several more questions. I'll let you pick. Oh, no, I don't pick. <laughs> Talk about diversity of the people asking I don't see questions. any women I asking know. questions. <laughs> oh. Great question. So the question here uh, summarized would be, you know, physicians are trained a certain way. They go to certain schools. Uh, how do they get better? How do they know their outcomes? How could we do a better job of, of working on these systems? Is that, is that fair? So the, the part here that I think is, is, I'll give you a quick example. So if you are of Asian descent, like myself, uh, there is a particular blood thinner that is a lifesaver, if you get it. For actually, most of the population is a lifesaver no matter what. For a certain population of us of, of Southeast Asian uh, ancestry, it is it, it will only work. There's another portion of us of Southeast Asian ancestry that if you're giving it to us, it will basically kill us. It's actually, it, 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 you'll bleed out. Because of this, what they basically look for on your intake form is, oh, Southeast Asian or any Asian, check mark, do not give. So we basically carte blanche because there might be some portion rather than asking the more sophisticated thing of like, could we do a quick genetic test that says, aha, you actually are in the bucket that should do this. So we don't even do tailored treatments. Yet the, the genome project is now you know, almost 15, 20 years old at this point. And so what is preventing that from happening? There's a bunch of things. One is the free flow of information of data. APIs into the healthcare system. But the second is also good that clinical trials and bringing all that data together in, in a new model. And what we need is almost a bioinformatics 2.0 that is starting to ask not just statistical things around data uh, uh, in the, the biomedical field, but the question of what do clusters look like and how can we take that information and rapidly drive it into the actual clinical practices, not just research practices. And just look in the last year and a half or so, we have seen radical revolutions uh, 180 degrees on medical treatments, estrogen therapy, uh, uh, mammograms, and prostate exams, all completely different recommendations now in just in a year and a half. That's how fast things are are changing. And we we have to get even more of that moving faster and that involves the clinical arm and the research arm coming more aggressively together. And that is a big premise of the Precision Medicine Initiative. But you're absolutely right. we got to do more of that. And, and especially when we get into questions around Lyme disease, mental health issues, or anything that falls into the broad bucket of what you might call population health. So in the back in the orange hoodie, you've been waiting for a while. Well, gray hoodie with the orange inside. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So the, 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 this is actually one of the greatest frustrations. Uh, you know, after uh, Vice President Biden's son uh, died of cancer, uh, brain cancer, geoblastoma, uh, we got all the best experts around the world together to basically say, what would be the one thing we could do? What could be the one thing we could do around, around cancer, outside of more money to, can- to cancer research? And the thing was, bring data sets together. Just bring more data sets together. 
Now, do we know concretely that there's a universal cure? Probably not. But is there enough information to change treatment plans in the same way like with these blood thinners or other things? Absolutely. That is clear cut. Because too many times cancer is an one of N type problem like Matt Might's son. is like, no, no, that's the only one. And we don't actually have a way of, of sharing those genetic results or sample sets. In fact, it's too hard to even do any real data science on these things right now because there's not any other data around it, including where you lived, where you grew up, or things that might be related to cancer clusters. Uh, so that, that's why we say it that way. And there's also not large-scale genetic screening or bringing in that data that could be brought together to ask some of those questions. So Jennifer is still alive, uh, and she actually has a second son uh, um, that was born about six, nine months ago, nine, nine ten months ago. Uh, so her and Rod still live in, in, in Austin, Texas, and they are going through aggressive uh, clinical trials to, to, to um, make sure she stays healthy. But it's, uh, science is not going fast enough for her. Uh, I'll tell you one of the most painful things is we called up We'd get these letters, and so when we were about to sign what's called uh, um, the 21st Century Cures Act, and I called a, a, a bunch of patients on the behalf of President Obama to invite them to the White House to be there for the signing ceremony. And one of the women, we just couldn't get through, and we did a search, uh, and she had just passed away the week before. So we missed by one week uh, just to even be able to, to reach out and talk to her. And, and that's, that's one of the tragedies of, of, of this fight is that all of this is possible. We just have to push that much harder. And, and, you know, we forget the stories of what it was like during polio and these other things when the full, right. the nation came together. Like, I guarantee you one thing, one thing above all, when the entire nation, the entire power of the United States of America wants to come together a, a, around a problem, there is nothing that can stand in its way. And we have done that time and time again. Whether that has been done during the, the, the airlift uh, for Berlin to fighting uh, for a cure for polio uh, or going after you know, smallpox, we have done that as a country. What we have to do is we have to have conviction to stay on these issues. Uh, and, and right now, we have a tragedy unfolding right now in front of us that we are refusing to address. Actually, multiple healthcare ones. The primary one right now being opioids. Mm -hmm. Secondary is flu pandemic. We have a flu where kids under four are dying, and we're not even talking about it. There's no head of CDC because the latest CD, head of CDC was, had to resign because she was taking tax dollars or basically doing all sorts of funny business with the tobacco industry. We have people in, the, in Houston, Texas, where there are chemicals leaching out from after the hurricane, but the EPA budget and people personnel have been cut. So we are not taking responsibility. And, and here's what we're screwing up. Right now, as my generation responsible for policy, we are not doing a sufficient job of handing over society to your generation. And this is what is so empowering we're seeing this weekend with the kids standing up in Florida, is you all have to stand up more aggressively. You cannot accept this status quo. And, and you have superpowers that nobody else does, not just your voice, but you've got technology. And so bring that to bear to whether you're fighting for a family member, you're fighting for a Jennifer Bittner, or you're fighting for just a neighbor. That's, that's the power. As, as a... Uh, what is it that might? I'm the Oregon Trail generation, mm -hmm. right? It's pretty amazing growing up and seeing uh, issues about the ozone layer. You're all too young to probably even remember, but the ozone layer was deteriorating and everybody was going to die of skin cancer. Uh, and this was due to CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, from hairsprays and other aerosols. Right? And the Reagan and Bush administration, EPAs, under, with the backing of the, the you know, Republican-controlled House, mm -hmm. Senate, and government, uh, got behind banning these things, and the ozone layers re well, yeah. largely replenished itself. And that was a huge, talking That's about right. the government, the 
you know, nation coming right. together and saying, this is a big deal that we need to address. Yeah. These are, now, if that was happening right now, the divisiveness behind right. anything related to climate change, that would never fly. And it's amazing. It's, it's very, so just, it, so these are bipartisan, right? I, so yeah. I serve, I've been fortunate to serve under two presidents. I've served under President Obama and President Bush. So I, I largely think of these as, as bipartisan issues that I'm talking about. In fact, for the, the, the criminal justice reforms, the, str- the staunchest supporter is Governor Bevin of Kentucky, who is extremely conservative. And, and we're able to really agree, like, look, this is a problem of humanity. We should not be just putting people in jail. Mm-hmm. All right, time for, time for one more hat right here. Yeah, I was just wondering if, uh, did you see a role as a data scientist change uh, when you from Bush to Obama and from year to year, or did it pretty much uh, stay the same? Mm-hmm. So uh, when I was in the, the Bush administration, I was a very low-level staffer in the, in the Department of Defense, uh, working on bioweapons. Pardon? Low-level coffee boy. Low-level coffee boy, Low level coffee boy uh, pretty much. Uh, uh, I had just got, you know, I was a young faculty member. Uh, so you can still, you could, you could get coffee. <laughs> but, but uh, the, you know, the, the role in the White House changes every day. You know, the, the, every day you walk into the White House, we say there's two hand grenades that roll into your office. You just don't know which two. There's always two crises. And your job is to make sure that you don't let the urgent get in the way of the important. And so, you know, like when I started, it was really focused on these long-term ARC health issues. So then Ferguson had happened, and, and we were really focused on how to address those kind of questions around those things, all the way down to questions around cybersecurity. And then finally, you know, at the very end, addressing questions of how do we hand the government off into a better place, and in particular, empowering the, the, uh, the local state governments to, to do more. So it, it's a job in, in these roles, and this is why data, the training that you, and the things that you're working on here, the one thing that I would tell you to do is learn to embrace ambiguity. One of the most important lessons I learned in the first time I served in government was I was with a tank commander who had just come back from Iraq, and he had, and we were just talking about the usual politics and craziness of some of the budget and items, and I was like, this is just chaos. And he's like, that is what is awesome. And I was like, what do you mean that's awesome? He's like, He's like, embrace the chaos because out of chaos comes opportunity. And so he's like, just run to the chaos, run to the fire, and let's figure out what we can do. And if you do that constantly, you will find ability to help and make things uh, work in a unique way. All right, I think we have to end on that. That was great. All right, thanks, guys.